while Bohr and de Broglie managed to describe the hydrogen atom, Schrodinger's equation was able to describe hydrogen with the same detail. And then, it could go far beyond. It manages to account not only for the hydrogen atom, but it describes nothing less than all the atoms and all the elements in the universe. Schrodinger's quantum mechanics explains every element in the periodic table of the elements. The solution to Schrodinger's equation, called the wave function, is a fantastically accurate description of the real world. Schrodinger's equation is really cool. Can we talk a little more about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? Isn't there more to consider than the approach we use to describe it? Werner Heisenberg did more than make a quantitative statement when he said that the particle's position and momentum could not be known simultaneously. He wrote an equation that quantified the relationship. Let's see how that information can lead to an easy understanding of the hydrogen atom described in exquisite detail by the Schrodinger equation. Without going into too much detail, let's look at a proton and an electron. Since the electron has a very tiny mass, it can occupy a very large region of space. Conversely, the proton has a very large mass, 2,000 times that of an electron. And therefore, it occupies a very tiny region of space. The result is a quantum mechanical hydrogen atom, a tiny mass of nucleus surrounded by a much larger cloud representing the electron. If we look at a simple graph relating the probability of finding the electron in a shell at a given distance from the nucleus, we find that as we travel outward from the nucleus, the probability increases at first as the shell expands. It reaches a maximum value and then decreases again as the electron cloud thins to almost nothing at large distances. Amazingly, the radius where the probability reaches a maximum is precisely equal to the radius of the first allowed orbit of Niels Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom. And its energy is exactly equal to the energy of an electron in this orbit in the Bohr atom. So this is a very good picture of a hydrogen atom with an electron in the lowest energy state. The electron occupies a cloud instead of an orbit. But it spends most of its time at the radius predicted as an orbit by the Bohr model. It also spends most of its time possessing the energy that an electron in that orbit would have. But of course the atom is not always found in the lowest energy state. As there are other orbits allowed in Bohr's model, there are other, higher energy states in the quantum mechanical hydrogen atom. These states are defined primarily by the quantum number, n, that we talked about earlier. And for each state, the electron has a different energy, which results from the shape of the electron cloud. For n equals 1, called the ground state, the shape is a symmetric cloud, the same in all directions. For n equals 2, the shape can take two forms, although both shapes have the same energy. One is a double spherical cloud, one sphere inside the other, while the other shape for n equals 2 is in the shape of a dumbbell. 
For other values of n, the shapes can be pretty strange. Like this torus, plus dumbbell shape. An electron in the lowest energy shell in an atom can be struck by and absorb the energy of a photon, giving it enough energy to jump to the next energy shell. And the reverse process allows the electron to jump back down into the lowest energy shell and emit a photon. The color of the photon depends on the energy difference between the two shells. This explains the spectral lines that identify an element. Since white light contains all the colors in the spectrum, when we shine white light on a sample of an element under the right conditions, the atoms absorb all the photons that allow their electrons to jump to other energy shells. So, the absorption spectrum is all the colors in white light minus those that match the difference in energy shells within the atom. And when those electrons spontaneously jump back down to the lowest energy levels, that emission spectrum contains only the lines that match the difference in the energy shells within the atom. Now it's time to investigate one of the most important properties of elementary particles one that literally shapes the atoms of each element in the periodic table. We have just discussed how Schrodinger's equation shows us how to accurately describe fundamental particles with a wave function. Now let's examine why two electrons together reveal a feature of quantum mechanics totally unlike anything in the large-scale world we inhabit. In a classical setting, even if two things are identical, they are still individuals. As long as we keep track of them carefully, we can treat them separately and label them A and B, or X and Y, or 1 and 2. But consider what is different about a two-electron system. Whether in an atom or in a box, it doesn't matter. Since the two electrons are consistently phasing in and out of existence, and since they are absolutely identical, it is impossible to keep track of specific individuals. Because of this, we must use a combined wave function to describe the pair rather than using two individual wave functions. This new two-particle wave function will have two parts to it and those parts will either add or subtract. Physicists would say this makes the wave function either symmetric or anti-symmetric. And it turns out that only the anti-symmetric function works for the electrons, and quarks, and protons, and neutrons. Let's let this red wave represent the first part of the combined wave function and this green wave represents the negative of the second part. If the electrons are in the same state, these two waves will be a mirror image of one another. As one goes up, the other goes down in perfect synchrony. So when we combine them, we get no wave at all. And since the wave is a map of electrons existing at that point, no wave means no electrons. So clearly, two electrons can never be in the same state because that causes their combined wave function to disappear. Now the only components making up the dynamical state in the atom is the shell it occupies and another property that electrons have called spin. You can think of electrons as little spinning tops, if that helps. And these electron tops can spin in only two ways. Upright or upside down, which can make them distinguishable. 
So the end result is that two and only two electrons can occupy each shell in an atom. One with spin up and the other with spin down. Other electrons in the atom must occupy higher and higher shells. This is called the Pauli exclusion principle, first espoused by Wolfgang Pauli. Without this exclusion, all electrons would occupy the lowest energy state, and atoms would behave very differently, and the universe would be a very different place. The fact is that the property called spin is quantized as well. No big surprise. And all the particles fall into one of two different families because of this. Those particles that have spin equal to one half, or three halves, or five halves, and so on, form the family called fermions. The name comes from Enrique Fermion who, along with Paul Dirac, developed the statistical methods of dealing with them. Fermions are said to have half integral spin. And as indicated above, electrons, quarks, protons, neutrons are all in this family. The other family of particles have spin equal to 0, 1, 2, three, and so on. They are called bosons, after Sadiendra Bose, who along with Einstein developed the statistics for dealing with this family. Unlike fermions, which must obey the Pauli exclusion principle, bosons do not. Groups of multiple bosons will all gather in the lowest available energy state. Photons, gluons, gravitons all fall into this family. If bosons had to obey the exclusion principle, many modern marbles could not exist. Like lasers, which require that huge numbers of photons be in the same state at the same time. And again, the universe would be a very different place.